All right, everybody, welcome to the Rowan College of Burlington County Global Studies Lecture Series, a continuation of a series of conversations that started in fall 2020 in global health, environment, and security and key international issues affecting those. This is partially sponsored by the U.S. Department of Education's uh, Undergraduate International Studies and Foreign Language Grant Program. Uh, and uh, Rowan College, along with Rowan, Uver Un Rowan University, our partner institution, uh, has a multi-year grant with the U.S. Department of Edu Education to build global and international studies designations uh, at both institutions and also courses in high demand languages such as Arabic and Chinese. Along with student activities reflecting these initiatives, such as the uh, lecture series we have here, um, this is, of course, also hosted by Rowan College, a mid-sized two and three year college in Mount Laurel, New Jersey, serving the geographically largest county in the state with anywhere from seven to nine thousand students each semester. RCBC has one of the most ethnically diverse student bodies in the state and larger mid-Atlantic region with one of the lowest tuition costs as well. Uh, and we're also an appropriate host institution for such a series on international issues like this, as we have not only one of the most student, uh, diverse student bodies, uh, such as, you know, based on things such as ethnic background, but also uh, country, uh, country of origin of students. I'm your host for this event in the series. I'm Brandon Chapman, instructor and department chair of anthropology and sociology at the college. It's nice to see uh, some of our returning uh, audience members and our guest here this evening. I'm also project director at the college of the previously mentioned grant. The goal of the lecture series is to bring to Rowan College campus and here uh, this evening, our virtual WebEx campus, top level scholars, academics, researchers, and industry professionals at all levels of career, early, mid, and late career that are experienced, knowledgeable experts in global health, environment, and international security issues. And of course, to develop this knowledge and skills in our students at both Rowan University and Rowan College, and to have a dynamic conversation about these key global issues within these areas, and to give our students such avenues to advance training in these topics as well. Look for more events in this series in the future. Uh, we just had an event uh, last week, and we're gonna have coming up uh, later this semester after spring break on March 24th, uh, I'll have as my guest Ahmed Kuru from, uh, he's a political scientist from San Diego State University. He's going to be doing a talk uh, based on his recent book on political and economic development across the Islamic world, Middle East and North Africa. Uh, so that'll be a new topic for the series, which should be uh, fascinating. And then on uh, April 5th, uh, just a couple weeks after that, I'll have as a returning guest Hal Brands from the John Hopkins School of uh, Advanced International Studies. He has a, a new co-authored book. Uh, and we're going to be having a discussion kind of like uh, Dr. Kimmage and I are going to be having this evening. We're going to be talking about uh, U.S.-China relations and the uh, China threat going forward uh, as in regards to Taiwan uh, and those sorts of issues. This evening, uh, we have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Michael Kimmage, Professor and Department Chair of History at the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. And I believe tonight he is uh, beaming to us from, uh, from the uh, suns or the February suns of Florida. Dr. Kimmage uh, specializes in the history of the Cold War and U.S.-Russia relations. Uh, beyond his previous, uh, he has numerous previous books published, uh, and I believe his forthcoming book is a study of transatlantic relations and U.S.-Russia relations uh, uh, from uh, World War I to the present, so basically about the past century or so. He's been a visiting professor uh, at various institutions across Central and Eastern Europe, including uh, the Ludwig uh, Maximilian University in Munich, Germany, and Vilnius University in Vilnius, Lithuania. Uh, in the mid-2010s, he served on the uh, uh, Department of State uh, as the Secretary of State's uh, policy planning staff, uh, where he was uh, involved with uh, Russia-Ukraine and the Russia-Ukraine portfolio, uh, certainly speaking to the topics that he's, we're going to be discussing tonight. Uh, Dr. Kimmage's articles and book reviews have appeared in a wide range of widely read uh, publications, such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, the New Republic, and the Los Angeles Review of Books. A note on format and agenda for this uh, uh, for this event here. Uh, for those of you as returning guests, some of you, uh, you're familiar that we've done this in various different ways before uh, over the past few years. And so this one uh, will be more of a discussion between uh, Dr. Kimmage and myself. And so what we'll do is we can ask for uh, questions as, you know, as we have this discussion and we talk as we go along. So uh, you should see uh, if you're in WebEx here, on the, um, you should have a bar somewhere, uh, either on the bottom or on the left or right hand side. And there is, uh, there's a button that looks like a little uh, talking cloud. Uh, that is the chat message board. And if you click that, uh, that should bring up uh, a place to type in uh, your questions and that sort of thing. Or you can raise your hand. There's also a icon that looks like a little hand. So pretty self-explanatory. You can click that and it will raise your hand and it will uh, give us uh, 
attention that you uh, uh, that you want to uh, ask a question and that sort of thing. So feel free to uh, chime in those questions, and I'll be helping moderate uh, those to um, uh, to Michael as we go through our talk here. So, um, so with that, and uh, and the the title of the uh, event that uh, uh, Dr. Kimmich has given us here, uh, appropriate, uh, called the cl uh, called collision. Uh, the origins of the war in Ukraine. Uh, we want to welcome uh, Dr. Kimmich to uh, Rowan College. So thank you, Michael, for uh, for being here. And uh, if we can, I, I suppose we can start with an initial question and we can get right into it. Um, so going off of that title that we just mentioned for this evening, um, you know, there is uh, there is certainly a history here to what we call and consider this large scale invasion, this war that started uh, in February 22 uh, with Russia invading Ukraine. We should note here that we are um, uh, this evening recording almost a week away from the year anniversary uh, of the Russia-Ukraine war. Uh, there are obviously uh, a fair amount of preceding events that have sort of led up to what was the full-scale invasion. And so perhaps to contextualize for our audience uh, and also just for our forthcoming talk here, um, perhaps we could rewind maybe something like eight, nine, or 10 years going back to the mid 2010s, something like that. Um, because, you know, we could go back to 2014, exa for example, and look at the, um, uh, when Russia supported uh, various Russian backed separatist groups uh, in the Donbass, uh, what we consider sort of Donetsk, uh, Donetsk and Luhansk regions of Eastern Ukraine, those, uh, those uh, regions that have been hardest hit and uh, partially or fully occupied during this uh, larger scale invasion. Um, you know, the, there has been a, there has been an off and on of different level of, of different scale conflict going on in this region for nearly a decade now. And on top of that, of course, we have a lot of other factors. You know, um, there have been various uh, military buildups on the Russian side over that, over the last decade or so by the Vladimir Putin regime. And then of course, you know, laying on top of all of that obviously is the, Vladimir Putin and the Putin regime itself, uh, especially with Vladimir Putin and his nationalist ideology and this idea of a larger Russian civilization that expands beyond the current Russian state. So I know there's sort of a lot there, but if we could rewind a bit, maybe again the last decade or so, or, or if you want to edit that timeline, that's fine. And maybe we can give um, some sort of context of the preceding events uh, that sort of uh, lead us to where we are starting about a year ago and then into the large scale invasion. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Professor Chapman, first of all, for the invitation to appear with, with you and, and, uh, and with your students. Uh, and thank you as well for the very, very kind uh, introduction. You know, it's, 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 it's wonderful to be uh, among you, and I very much look forward to, uh, to, the, to the conversation that we have uh, before us. I think that if we tell the story of the war, the story has to revolve around Putin's decision to go to war. So that's what we have to arrive at. And, you know, that will tell us important things, not everything, but important things, certainly about the origins uh, of the 2022 war. And I might go back uh, to November of 2013 uh, and to an event that nobody really at the time looked upon as especially important. And the question then was, would Ukraine sign an association agreement with the European Union? This was not about membership in the European Union, but it would have enabled trade, commerce, you know, sort of legal connections between Ukraine and the European Union. Now, this had been done with other countries. In many respects, it seems sort of like a bureaucratic uh, formality, uh, but this uh, imposed upon the then president of Ukraine, Viktor Yanukovych, a choice. Uh, and he dithered, uh, and he tried to prevent the choice, and he tried to evade the choice, and at a certain point he had to choose. Uh, and when he chose in November of 2013 not to sign the association agreement uh, and to incline Ukraine more toward Russia, it felt like he wasn't just deciding about Europe, but was making this big, uh, you know, sort of almost geographic or civilizational choice for the country uh, of Ukraine. And that elicited from many Ukrainians, uh, especially those living in Kiev, maybe younger Ukrainians, those who felt more of an orientation toward Europe, a very strong sense of outrage. And that outrage led to protests in the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, that President Yanukovych dealt with very ineptly. He, you know, sort of, on the one hand, didn't have a way of persuading the crowds to sort of stand back. Uh, on the other hand, he used brute violence against them, and that just brought out more people 
uh, to protest. And so out of the acorn of this association agreement or unsigned association agreement grew the oak tree of revolution. Uh, and that was not anything that people would have predicted, I think, in Ukraine in the summer of 2013 or in 2012, 2011, uh, 2010. And so there is a way in which our whole story, the story of the war, begins to a degree with an accident, uh, or at least with an accidental set of circumstances. And the most important of those circumstances is when Viktor Yanukovych on the 22nd of February, 2014, decides to flee the country. He really, you know, in a way, he had almost come to a point of resolution with the protesters, but he must have feared for his own safety or for whatever the, you know, whatever the reasons were for him. He runs away to Russia and he leaves Ukraine in a state of temporary paralysis. And Putin, uh, this is sort of the second phase uh, of, of our story, responds to this paralysis. He could have done nothing. He could have just stood back and sort of waited for the next set of developments in Ukraine, but he decides to respond to this moment by annexing Crimea, uh, a peninsula to the south of, uh, in the southern portion of uh, Ukraine. And then gradually, this is sort of over the course of, you know, sort of March, April, May, June of 2014, infiltrating Eastern Ukraine, contributing there to a separatist movement that was not extremely strong. It was uh, not entirely artificial, but it was, you know, sort of moderate, uh, and that becomes a vehicle for Putin's military intervention into Ukraine's east. Uh, I would say by the time we get to this turning point, not the flight of Yanukovych, but the decision to annex Crimea and infiltrate the territory of Ukraine in its, in its eastern places, uh, in some ways the die is cast. And the 2022 war really follows from this moment in the following way, and I'm getting some sticking with Russia here. We could look about look at this from the perspective of Ukraine. We could look at it from the perspective of the United States, NATO, the European Union. There are many other vantage points, but because we're trying to figure out the Russian decision, I'll sort of stay within the Russian framing uh, of the story. Putin is trying to resolve a certain problem in 2014 through the annexation of Crimea and invasion of Eastern Ukraine. The problem that he's trying to solve is a country that he sees as going out of his grasp, going away, floating away into Europe, uh, you know, sort of like the balloon that floated into American airspace uh, a week or so ago. Ukraine was floating away from Russia, uh, and this was for Putin an intolerable outcome. Instead of trying to persuade the people of Ukraine to do otherwise, Putin resorted to force. And that, in a way, committed him very much to events that were going on on the ground in Ukraine. He became the owner uh, of Ukrainian territory, at least uh, for a while. And at the same time, it really backfired for Putin because by annexing Crimea and initiating a war between Russia and Ukraine, the people of Ukraine, who to a degree had been divided up before 2014 on which orientation the country should have, move much more explicitly in a Western or European direction. So in a way, the outcome that Putin is trying to prevent is the outcome that he encourages with his own actions. He creates a problem uh, not entirely of his own making, but largely of his own making. This is not how Putin would characterize the story. He would have a different version of events, but this is my own sense of things. So for, for six to eight years, um, between 2014 and 2022, uh, Putin is stuck. He's stuck with an annex Crimea, and that is a popular event in Russia. That's sort of a part of Putin's legacy uh, as he sees it. He has a very messy occupation of territories in eastern Ukraine, these kind of gangster republics that he creates there that don't really help anyone in Ukraine uh, or in Russia. And Putin has a sort of wait and see attitude. You know, can he bring you back? Can he bring Ukraine back into the uh, into the Russian fold? And I would say that he concludes, I'm not quite sure when, 2020, 2021, very early in 2022, he concludes that this is just not working. That if he waits longer, if he waits five years, 10 years, the next leader of Russia, uh, at a certain point, Ukraine is just going to be gone. Uh, and he will be the president of Russia who lost Ukraine. Uh, and so I think that becomes the underpinning of his decision to go to war on the 20, uh, 24th of February, uh, 2022. It was a way of regaining something that he felt was his. Uh, it did contribute to Putin's sense of what the security order should be in Europe. So it was a kind of move, a strategic move, as he understood it before the war, uh, to bring Russia into a position of greater influence in Europe. And he was very optimistic about what the war would do and what the war would bring, how quickly it would be over. In his own mind, he wouldn't have done it otherwise. In his own mind, his decision to invade uh, 
was a masterstroke. It was a strategic masterstroke. So let me leave it at that. I think that that to me is the best I can do to explain Putin's reasoning for for pulling the trigger on the twenty fourth of February, twenty twenty two. Well, and it's it's very good to get some context for why necessarily February twenty two because it doesn't see you know there is obviously this uh, you know there was this months upon months of quite explicit literally along the borders of Ukraine uh, you know tank buildup and military buildup of course that what the world started to see and you know then the the, you know, the more public outcry and just the more international uh, exposure that it got at that time and you know why why that time period and then why specifically you know almost one year ago uh would this be the time period and not otherwise but you uh you you've contextualized better than anyone i've heard so far about why the timing would be that because it is sort of uh again this is obviously a uh situation where it is you know one if not you know, potentially more, but you one person, Vladimir Putin, making these sorts of decisions and getting into that mindset of why you know it's it's kind of a uh, a fed up state of you know this uh, th this large country on his borders who he feels are Russians or should be a part of Russia are you know again as you say floating away to Europe. We should contextualize here, um, even you know th we have a good amount of polling data um from uh ukraine and of ukrainians you know across the country about their feelings about russia and independence and all that sort of stuff and um even in the eastern parts um even in Donetsk and luhansk for example i mean uh polls up to like 2018 2019 i believe still showed a majority of people uh you know not not su certainly not supporting russian invasion of any sort obviously but also just supporting uh, you know, staying in Ukraine and not necessarily being a separatist sort of republic. So, because that's sometimes a misunderstanding that uh, the public has, and so you know, that's uh, that's something sort of going off of what you initially started talking about. We should we should emphasize. You also talked about the irony of you know uh, this invasion and you know the 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 thought, of course, of the the initial what what we're thought we're going to thought to be the initial successes of it becoming uh, pretty uh, you know pretty widespread and pretty uh, thorough failures. And uh, there are a lot of ironies here I think we're gonna talk about over the next hour or so, cause that's, you know, that's that's a consistent theme, I think, given the mismanagement of the war, um, that's been pretty obvious, you know, since uh, since it started. Um, maybe we could go off of this, um, uh, sort of extending what you uh, ended here with, Michael. Um, you sort of explained about why, you know, giving, giving you know, at least a partial explanation about why it starts and when it does. Um, you know, this, th th at least the way I interpret it and the way I see it, you know, the start of this, the start of the large scale invasion is one of the, honestly, one of the weirdest starts to a war I've ever seen. You know, you've got this really, again, months upon months of literally just sitting tanks at the borders, all this, all this infrastructure, um, basically pr quite explicitly saying, you know, there's a likelihood we're going to go in. Uh, telegraphing this to quite a degree, and you know, then on top of that, you've got um, you know a uh, um, y you know a a, a very uh, something that feels like it's from decades ago, sort of rolling in of tanks, you know, uh, through eastern Ukraine, Ukraine, um, a Russian military that did not look prepared in any way for what it was going to be um, up against. And, you know, I, I joked with my students, it didn't necessarily remind me of World War II. It reminded me also uh, maybe even of, you know, World War One or something like that. It was just so, uh, uh, so odd to see this in the modern day, all of this just slow rolling of stuff into the eastern part of the country. Um, you know, how it, did, is there a way to understand, is Putin this isolated and this sort of delusional about what would happen? I mean, what, what, is there a way to explain just the sort of, I mean, obviously initial mismanagement, but then just the continued mismanagement of this war, which seems to be, um, especially those that follow it closely, uh, there have been many military experts that have called it, you know, one of the most badly mismanaged wars, perhaps in recent or modern history. So um, maybe we could talk about that a little bit. Right. Well, let's begin, I think, by giving Putin his due uh, as, a, as a figure. And then in a moment, I'll sort of go into the ways in which I think he massively screwed up when it came to the war. But if Zelensky had fled the country, as the United States didn't ask him to do, but gave him the option of doing at the beginning of the war, uh, you know, if he had sort of run away to, you know, to Poland or to, you know, Chicago or wherever he could have, uh, he could have gone to, I, I'm not sure Putin's plan would have failed. Um, you know, if there had been no Ukrainian government at the beginning of the war, uh, 
um, it's possible that Putin would have been able to accomplish what he set out to do, which is probably the partition of the country and the sort of creation of a kind of colony. It would, there would have been an insurgency. It would have been very messy. It, you know, probably would have ended up as a kind of different nightmare uh, for Putin and, and, and for the rest of us. But, um, you know, there were ways in which the Ukrainian response at the very beginning of the war hang on a, hung on a very slender thread. That sl thread was really Zelensky's will and resolve. Uh, and uh, it wasn't inevitable that we had the Zelensky that we had in the first couple of weeks of the war. So I just say that, uh, um, uh, speaking of contextualizing, maybe to contextualize the, in quotation marks, the rationality uh, of Putin's thinking prior to the war. But the irrationality of Putin's thinking is, of course, the more important subject because that affected the war that actually transpired once he invaded on the 24th of February. I think that you can begin the explanation by noting that Putin is by training an intelligence officer. Uh, he did work in the mayor's office of St. Petersburg in the 1990s, but then he was you know, sort of taken to Moscow by Boris Yeltsin and he was made the director of the FSB, the successor institution to the KGB, the sort of Soviet secret police. And I think when you imagine this war as the war of an intelligence officer, a lot kind of comes into focus, including the diplomacy that you mentioned in the lead up uh, to the war. It seems to me like Putin placed a premium on deception. Uh, he wanted to deceive the world uh, into what was happening or about what was happening. He wanted to gain the element of surprise uh, by doing so. And I think deception is the typical tool uh, of an intelligence officer. And Putin has a number of successes to his credit in, in previous years. We might you know, think back to the election meddling in 2016 in the United States where deception uh, could work to his uh, advantage. But I think he put a lot of his poker chips on this issue of deception. And I think th he thought that what deception would give him was surprise. Uh, and with that surprise, he could topple the house of cards that he believed the Ukrainian government to be. He could sort of rapidly take territory, sort of a shock and awe vis-a-vis -vis the Ukrainian population. And they would either out of sympathy for Russia or out of fear of the Russian military, they would bow down uh, to, the, to, the, to the invading soldiers. Uh, and, you know, that is perhaps the fantasy of an intelligence officer and you might add to that, this is very pure speculation, the effect of the pandemic on Putin, the effect of being a quasi dictator. And now I think he is a dictator of Russia, uh, being in power for 22 years, uh, being surrounded by mediocre figures, having built up a big pyramid of psychophants around him who just say, yes, boss, uh, your ideas are terrific. And so all of that, I think, contributes to a very uh, narrow minded uh, and in the end delusional uh, decision making. You know, had Russian, the Russian military followed its own military doctrine, what they would have done had they decided to invade was to use air power and artillery to, uh, to soften up Ukraine and probably use cyber to try to take out, uh, you know, sort of critical infrastructure in Ukraine. And you would have done that for weeks or perhaps months, and then you would have had uh, the ground invasion. Uh, that's how the military would have preferred to do it. Of course, if you do that, you don't get this big surprise. Uh, at the beginning of the war, but you wouldn't have gotten, had they chosen that path, you wouldn't have gotten what you actually got at the beginning of the war, which was a massively uncoordinated military that had no idea what it was doing at the beginning of the war. And really for months of the war, there's not even a single military commander. So you have these four military districts that are all invading kind of simultaneously uh, and invading a country that's the size of Texas with a population of a little bit less than 40 million that contrary to Putin's expectations was eager to fight and had the instruments uh, to fight. Uh, some of that is Ukraine's own investment since 2014. Some of that is achieved through cooperation with the West. And because of the brutality of the Russian invasion, exactly what you're saying, these are the optics of World War I or World War II. They don't feel like the optics of our world. He utterly shocks the populations of Europe and I think the American population as well and that enables the governments of Europe and the U.S. government to provide a kind of support to Ukraine that would have been unthinkable before the war. So it is a screw up, not of modest proportions, it's a screw up of extraordinary proportions. Uh, and a lot <laughs> of that happens to Putin in the course of the first couple of weeks is sort of unlucky. Uh, but I can't imagine any uh, serious military planner would have conceived a war uh, in Putin's terms. And that makes me go back to this notion of Putin as sort of the all, all powerful uh, intelligence officer. Maybe one final detail in terms of the war and why it goes so badly for Putin, which is perplexing as well. Uh, and, you know, the U.S. communicates to Russia months before the war that it has intelligence about what the war is going to look like. Uh, 
Uh, and it's also communicated to, to Russia that U.S. is going to back Ukraine seriously if Russia invades. It's a little bit reminiscent, different times, different circumstances, but a little bit reminiscent of the British tipping off Stalin that Hitler is going to invade when he did uh, in the summer of 1941, and Stalin didn't believe it, and you know was sort of, you know, especially shocked when the when Operation Barbarossa began uh, on on Soviet soil. So that's another perplexing aspect of this war. In a way, Putin could have put those pieces together, but out of cynicism or you know uh, whatever the explanation is, uh, he didn't, and the price he's paying for for that the, the price he's paying for that is the price that we've seen uh, over the last 12 months, uh, uh, a shambolic military operation. Sure. Yeah, and you bring up you bring up interesting points here too about you know if there had been say in a sort of parallel universe if there had been more emphasis on the air power the sea power that sort of stuff instead of the land power what would the European mostly U.S. response as far as sending military equipment had been or what you know how would that have been different it, it we we would be maybe in quite a different world um, you know compared to say a, a lot of the you know the the, the, the sort of um, uh, you know, ground military uh, uh, items that uh, are, you know it's, have been somewhat used and needed in this in this sort of situation that they, they has befallen them. Um, to go to all go off something else you said to give Putin some credit here and this sort of lead into the next question. Um, you know, even with this sort of stalemate in a way that we've been in for a while now, about a year into the war. Um, there is still, of course, partial or full control of some territories uh, in Luhansk and Donetsk, uh, Donetsk and Luhansk. Um, these are not just, you know, this is not just passive uh, 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 behavior here. This is, you know, quite serious stuff. This is, uh, you know, uh, there has been uh, some reporting evidence of, you know, uh, children uh, being taken out of that part of Ukraine and put with Russian families across the border. Uh, there is obviously, of course, the death that occurs from a conflict like this and the ongoing uh, sort of battles and just the incomplete disruption and uh, of infrastructure and economy and all of that. So I, I question is, you know, the way that, you know, especially, you know, the public can think about a war and we say a war, you know, there's, there's always this question of when is it going to end and who's going to win and who's going to lose? Well, you know, even in, even in a situation where, you know, let's say Russia continues to hold on even partially to a few cities or a few parts of the eastern sliver of Ukraine, you know, does the Putin regime, does the Russian state still get something out of that? Um, I, I mean, I certainly think it would, it does in, in numerous ways, but perhaps you can, you know, talk about that. Um, this idea of sort of winning, quote unquote, or losing the war is, it's not that clear cut necessarily, right? So maybe you could speak to, if this continues to be sort of an ongoing situation, the situation we've kind of been in for the past, again, almost a year, even holding on to those smaller amounts of the eastern part of Ukraine, what does that do? Is that still kind of a vic in in Putin's mind and the and the Russian regime's mind? Is that still kind of a victory in some ways, um, given that ongoing uh, context? So two answers to your excellent question. I think one that goes to the heart of the mistake that Putin has made with this war. But the second, I'll sort of try as best I can to think about the war again as Putin sees it uh, and the reason that he keeps perpetuating it, which is not just uh, to stave off losing. I think he has in his eyes a kind of master plan for the war. And it's it's it's, it's important, I think, to to speculate about what that might be because it could help us to to anticipate where his next moves uh, might uh, might fall. Uh, in terms of the the mistake that Putin has made, uh, it has a lot to do with the excellence of the Ukrainian military. Uh, and part of that is a question of sort of resolve and political leadership that the Ukrainian military has made good choices over the course of the uh, of the war. And the Ukrainian military has also, and this is not a given uh, of warfare, has been able to integrate uh, Western technology or you know the technology that the countries around the world have been donating to Ukraine for the sake of its war effort, it's been able to integrate that remarkably well. That was a big frustration for the U.S. with the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, that they could bring in the sophisticated weaponry, but they couldn't necessarily integrate it into the Afghan uh, or Iraqi armies. And, and Ukraine has been different uh, in that regard. And so what we saw in September and October, one of the key turning points of the war, is that Ukraine was able to go on the offensive uh, and was able to succeed on the offensive. This is initially around Kharkiv and then uh, and then Kherson. And so we'll see this spring and summer where the offensive that Ukraine is planning takes Ukraine. Uh, but it's possible that Ukraine could sort of poke a hole uh, in the land bridge that Russia has from Russia to Crimea, 
uh, or possible that maybe they could go further and really start retaking back significant chunks of territory uh, in uh, in the Donbas. What that means uh, is that everything that Russia holds at the present moment is vulnerable in some way. So Crimea is not going to fall back into Ukraine's lap uh, in the next you know sort of year or two because Russia will defend it uh, to the hilt and they're pretty dug in there. But Crimea is now vulnerable to missile strikes. Uh, and the closer Ukraine gets to Crimea, the more they can uh, pursue that kind of uh, approach. Uh, and so it's not in any sense a normal place to be. Wherever you are in the occupied Russian territories of Ukraine, it's not normal. And oddly enough, that's sort of what Putin himself did to him, uh, what Putin did to himself in 2022, because I think life in Crimea was pretty normal between 2014 and 2022, at least for those who sort of signed on to the uh, to the occupation project. And it really makes you question what's the value of this territory that Russia has acquired. They may be able to hold on to it in some sense, but uh, it's going to be the front line. Uh, and it's going to be the front line in the face of a very formidable and strengthening Ukrainian military. So that, uh, again, speaks to the kind of blunder that Putin has made uh, with this war. But I doubt that Putin is in an, in an especially self-critical mood. Uh, and I think that he looked at the future in the following terms. Again, just doing the best I can guessing uh, as to his uh, as to his calculus. I think he feels secure in his power in Russia. There's no opposition movement to speak of. Uh, it's a repressive structure that he's put in place, but he's got you know the economic instruments to keep that repressive structure going. I think he believes, and he may not be wrong, that Russians are in a kind of patriotic mood at the moment and don't want to lose the war. They'll sort of continue fighting it for the foreseeable future, foreseeable future. He's found workarounds for the Russian economy in many ways. You know, he's able to sell gas and oil to India uh, and to China and to markets other than Europe. And through subterfuge or just the complexities of the global economy, he can get software and microchips. It's not the same as before. It's harder, but it's not uh, entirely bleak. So he can keep his war machine up and running for quite some time. And that's exactly what he intends to do. And I think he feels that in doing that, he can test the resolve maybe not of Ukraine, he probably knows at this point that Ukraine is going to fight in perpetuity, but he can test the resolve of the United States, he can test the resolve of the Europeans, maybe he can engage in a certain amount of meddling uh, in the politics. There was just news over the last week that Russia was perhaps trying to stage a coup in Moldova. So you can do those kinds of things, impose costs on the supporters of Ukraine, and see if that support begins uh, to crack. Uh, and in the midst of that, uh, you know, as Russia mobilizes and perhaps restores, replenishes its stocks of ammunition and missiles, it may go on the offensive and try to take a city like Odessa in the south of Ukraine. Obviously, Russia has been struggling over the last couple of months to take the medium-sized city or town uh, of Bakhmut, and they're not doing a very good job of it. So, you know, that may be delusional uh, on Putin's part, but I think the hope is still there for him uh, that he can, you know, sort of move things forward militarily in the next year or two. Uh, and that the politics uh, in the West is likely to change and a kind of impatience will start to grow uh, or a new person might get elected in country X, Y, or Z uh, and Russia's prospects may begin uh, to brighten. So, you know, has Putin reviewed the situation, looked at his mistakes and come to a kind of honest reckoning? I very much doubt it. Uh, is a lot of what he's thinking now potentially delusional? Yes, uh, but I think he still feels like he has a plan and, you know, sort of by God, he's going to stick to it uh, until that plan is objectively retired or objectively disrupted. The, the underlying ideology, may, of, of course, is still there, but the, he, he does he does adapt. You know, there is evidence that he does. You know, he's, it's it's not just, uh, you know, always full scale ahead, I suppose, or, you know, in some ways he, he, he is adaptable. He is flexible in some respects, you, you know, and, and how much of this is just uh disruption to you know uh the idea that uh some sort of prolonged disruption um can you know weaken ukrainian uh the ukrainian economy long term uh push you know a lot of uh, you know refugees out uh you know some of the um more talented uh you know folks uh, in the country that sort of thing and uh, and you know and and threaten uh, Ukraine essentially to try to not to join uh, the EU or NATO or these other these other bodies, right? So they, there's so there's certainly again multiple, you know, not only the uh, the actual occupation, but just the even just the disruption, even if you don't occupy a, a city or a certain part of the of the country. Um, you, you know, Michael, you have a lot of experience at the Department of State, and it seems in the sort of understanding relations between us and, and Russia and Ukraine. Um, I'm wondering, uh, there's a lot of talk, of course, as a conflict like this goes on, 
about negotiation, right? And, uh, you know, is it possible to, with uh, such, um, such a figure uh, like Putin uh, and the regime to be able to negotiate, one, the possibility of actually negotiating the settlement that can stick, given his history of breaking previous agreements, obviously. Um, and then also, you know, um, even negotiating, a, what would be the terms of such a negotiating a negotiation, you know, uh, if there is some sort of land, even a minor land swap where already occupied territories or even portions of those territories, you know, stay Russian occupied, um, is that a, is that an acceptable um, negotiation outcome? You know, so so given that, and again, given some of your history looking at the relations of these countries, uh, perhaps this, it speaks to some of your experience. Um, what is the negotiation aspect here? Do you think it's practical? Do you think there's any sort of outcome from such a thing that could even be reasonable? Um, what would be your take on this? So I'll answer your question initially with an emphatic no. Uh, I, I don't see prospects for negotiation. Um, you know, I would say this is a bit of an academic point, but we have a, it's an academic gathering, so I feel it's 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 okay to make an academic point uh, in this setting. It's not that the U.S. doesn't negotiate with unsavory actors. I don't want to say that they're unsavory countries. That's 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 not the right formulation. But it doesn't. It's not. It's not that the U.S. never negotiates with difficult governments. In the wind down to the war in Afghanistan, the United States negotiated with the Taliban, uh, which is the you know the political entity that gave uh, you know sort of home and support to Al Qaeda before the 9-11 invasion. So if you can negotiate with the Taliban, in, in, in principle, you can kind of negotiate uh, with anyone. And it's not that the Taliban was, you know, sort of trustworthy or, or, or sort of easy to deal with. It's just that the necessity was there uh, to do it. And so if the necessity is there, uh, it can be done. Uh, the U.S. works with undemocratic governments. It works with governments that murder its own citizens, uh, you know, governments that invade, that violate the sovereignty of, of, of neighbors. Uh, et cetera. So that to me is not the stumbling block, but um, uh, but something else, uh, something else is. Uh, it's not the the sort of um, the personality of Putin or his deviousness uh, that stands in the way. Uh, for me, it's the way in which Russia uh, over the past couple of years, uh, and maybe going back to 2008 with the invasion of Georgia, but certainly in the, in the past couple of years, the way in which Russia has signed on to very radical uh, objectives. Uh, we're not talking about the readjustment uh, of a small border, bad as that would be. Uh, we're not talking about even the annexation of Crimea, which is a violation of international law and is accompanied with all kinds of human rights abuses, but um, did, you know, sort of address a population that to a degree was, 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 was pro-Russian. It doesn't make it tolerable, but, um, you know, annexation of Crimea is something that the West uh, could live with. Putin's objectives in Ukraine are truly extreme. You know, they included at the beginning of the war toppling the government of Ukraine. He would have been very uh, eager to partition the country. Uh, and we know also from the way in which the first few months of the war um, transpired, uh, really the whole war, that what occupation means is something, you know, sort of similar to the way that the German army occupied territory in the Second World War, you know, as you mentioned. Uh, uh, forced uh, uh, movement of Ukrainian children from the the, the territory of Ukraine uh, to Russia. These filtration camps. There's been extensive journalism about that of sort of selecting people and putting them into different groups uh, and kind of treating them accordingly. And I think we all know the stories of Irpin and and, and Bucha and you know sort of extreme human rights abuses that have been committed uh, in the course of uh, of the Russian occupation. So in the midst of those extreme objectives. Uh, I think that the U.S. has to just be sober about what's uh, what's possible. Could a Russian government come about that rejects those objectives, changes course, goes in a new direction? That's possible, uh, and we should be you know sort of ready and waiting, ready and waiting for that moment when and if it comes. Uh, but until then, you have to deal with the government that you have. So I just don't think that there's compromise possible uh, under these circumstances. I also think that Putin had an option to go for compromise, and that option would have been not to invade in February, to pull back. And I think he would have been uh, 
you know, given quite a bit in return, you know, sort of possibly some agreement about Ukraine and NATO or possibly a sort of reconfiguration of U.S., you know, uh, sort of missiles and forces uh, in Europe. So if those were the issues that were between us uh, and those were the negotiable issues, it is important to note that Putin turned his back on those uh, before the war started and the war has just pushed him uh, further in a, in a radical direction. So I would say that it's not, uh, it doesn't make sense. Uh, it doesn't make sense for the United States. I think this is clearly the position of the Ukrainian government that it's not uh, in the mood, the mood to negotiate. And so and we can sort of develop this point in greater detail, if you wish. I would say that the position of the U.S. should be more or less what it was in the first opening phases of the Cold War. I think containment uh, is the framework. We're not going to get out of this conflict through diplomacy and negotiation. Russia is not going to make that possible, nor should we uh, you know, sort of bow to its wishes uh, in this regard, but containment could perhaps get us to a manageable phase uh, of the uh, a manageable phase of the conflict. Final point about why it's you know imprudent, I think, also to negotiate with Putin at least on this. So you know, Crimea, the territory that Putin annexed, uh, and he was sanctioned for annexing it, but that was never deeply contested by the West. The annexation of Crimea. Crimea is the territory that Putin uses in February 2022 to invade. The southern portions uh, of Ukraine. So it was a launching pad. It was a staging ground. So I think that if you would say we can get out of this conflict by giving Putin Donetsk and Luhansk, it seems to me very possible that Putin would use that as a future staging ground for the second, third, fourth round of this war uh, that would come at some future date. So that would be, uh, if my analysis is correct, that would be deeply counterproductive. It, it's it's an excellent it's an excellent point. Uh, we do need to be as a country and as a population. We, we do negotiate, as you say, with we, we have a long history, obviously, of negotiation and relations with most any regime. But we do have to be especially careful and especially uh, um, you know cognizant of the history of this regime breaking its agreements and also, as you said, uh, these other factors are you know they're they're they're, they're incredibly uh, incredibly important here. I think we have a hand up here. Um, we can. Uh, we can get a question here, maybe from uh, if, does Kyle have a question? Uh, Kyle, uh, go ahead, and then after that, maybe we can talk about the containment uh, uh, issue that you mentioned because I think you wanted to uh, focus on that, Michael. So, uh, Kyle, uh, go ahead if you have your audio on. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, you, you both are talking about uh, negotiation and you know how we typically negotiate with uh, difficult governments and things of that nature. Um, I was curious, what what are your thoughts? And I know because it's recency bias for the most part, but uh, the controversial decision for uh, uh, Brittany Griner and Victor Boot uh, and how that may impact everything. Uh, obviously, controversial, there were mixed bags as far as how, people's views on that. What are the implications for that uh, from uh, U.S. security perspective, as well as uh, uh, Russia and, and its impact globally um, in that regard? Thank you, Kyle. It's 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 an excellent and very important, uh, very important question. Um, you know, I won't uh, sort of litigate uh, the decision itself, but uh, will sort of say something that I think connects your question with the question that um, that Professor Chapman asked uh, a moment ago about negotiation. That diplomacy has, I think, different layers uh, and uh, and levels. And during the Cold War, what I think the United States learned with the Soviet Union is that you could have conflict on one level and a certain amount of what we could describe as diplomacy on another level. It wasn't agreement. It wasn't like the US and the Soviet Union were able to agree on the status of Berlin uh, or you know, larger questions of the Cold War, but there were ways of balancing and mediating uh, the conflict. In the Cold War, a lot of that was arms control, sort of managing nuclear weapons. That, to me, seems like it's been put on ice with the beginning of the war, and I have a lot of worries and concerns about that and would like to see the United States and Russia get back to some kind of conversation about arms control, even in the midst of the war, because it's just important for the security and safety uh, of all of us. But there have to be sort of ways and mechanisms for the Russian government and the U.S. government to work these kinds of things out. And prisoner exchanges are very, very, um, you know, sort of, as you say, politically contentious, controversial. Uh, you know, it's very difficult to measure, you know, is, is, is it sort of, is the worth of one prisoner the same as the worth uh, of, a, of another prisoner? And, you know, I can understand why the Biden administration uh, sort of made the deal that it made uh, with, with Brittany Griner, but um, it's, it's, it's certainly not, uh, it's certainly not easy, but there have to be ways for these two governments in the midst of a war uh, to work out uh, some of these things. I'll just add one other 
thing. It wasn't in your question, but I'll just uh, Kyle, but I'll add it to the uh, to the discussion. There was something that the U.S. and Russia worked out uh, when Russia moved into Syria in 2015, where the U.S. had uh, and I think still has some important military assets. U.S. and Russia worked out something called deconfliction. So what they established was a sort of military hotline uh, that went from the Pentagon to the Ministry of Defense uh, in in Moscow. And there was some discussion and conversation about, well, we have our plane here, you have your plane there. Uh, let's you know sort of try to work these uh, work these things out. And uh, I don't think that there's deconfliction in the war in Ukraine because the war in Ukraine is is. Uh, is much more eyeball to eyeball when it comes to the U.S. and Russia. But there, too, you do want to think of maybe certain mechanisms uh, that you can have in the relationship to avoid the worst case uh, scenarios. So it's not as if these two governments can simply stop dealing with one another. They have to find ways of uh, of doing so. But it's all in the shadow of the war. Uh, and it's it's never been more difficult. As a historian, I can say I think this uh, with a certain amount of confidence. Not uh, in the whole history of the Cold War, has diplomacy been as difficult as it is right now between Russia and the U.S.? And your question to Kyle, you know, why not uh, Paul Weiner, some of these other folks, uh, Americans that have been, uh, uh, you know, uh, falsely imprisoned or imprisoned on false uh, charges? Uh, you know, it's it, it, as as Michael said, it's it's uh, negotiating uh, prisoner swaps is one of the most probably probably one of the most difficult. Uh, international games you can play, you know, again, how how much value do you put on one compared to the other? And, you know, what does the other country want? And it, it's just, it, it is, a, we, we do the best we can, but it is, a, I have no envy at all, and no, nor should anybody for, uh, you know, anybody involved with those negotiations, because they are, uh, they, they are, um, you know, a very difficult issue to, to resolve. Um, Michael, you said, uh, you had mentioned, yeah, I know you you've written a lot about the history of the Cold War, um, and uh, you had mentioned containment as a strategy. Um, maybe you could uh, elaborate on that a little bit going forward and talking, we can maybe do the, you know, sort of last part of our session here, maybe on future prospects uh, of the war going forward in this situation. Um, you know, we have, uh, I think the term has been used, uh, or the analogy has been used, the Tehran on the Moscow, or Tehran on the Volga, you know, uh, Moscow becoming the sort of sanctioned or more isolated, um, you know, what, what, what are gonna be the effects of the long-term sanctions? Uh, and the I relative isolation of the Russian economy uh, with this. Um, I don't know if that's what you have in uh, as partial in mind of containment or maybe something else, but uh, maybe you could elaborate on what you mean uh, and, and perhaps compare it like you were mentioning to the to the Cold War history and, and what you're thinking there with this. Definitely. So, I mean, I think in terms of sanctions, going back not to the Cold War, but to 2014, sanctions were a pretty, pretty big flop. Uh, after 2014. I can say this as somebody who worked in the State Department in those years. Our goal was to get Russia out of Crimea and to get Russia out of eastern Ukraine. That's what we pegged sanctions to. And not only did that not happen uh, since 2014, but Russia invaded in a, in a massive way in 2022, which was sort of beyond our wildest imaginings uh, in 2014. But in a way, the future was much worse than we expected it uh, to be. That's not because of sanctions, but sanctions certainly didn't get us to a better place uh, after 2014, 2015. And sanctions have been a bit of a flop over the course of the last year, at least in terms of the expectations that were created for them, you know, sort of before the war and at the very beginning of the war. The idea was this was going to hobble the Russian economy. It was going to create rifts within the regime. It was going to put people, push people out into the streets of Russia to sort of protest the economic fallout of the war. And that hasn't happened. And Russia has found ways of, you know, sort of navigating. I think there was a half uh, percentage point of, of GDP growth in Russia over the course of the last year. When you compare that to the GDP of Ukraine declining by one third, uh, you see a huge disparity there. And you know sanctions have just uh, fallen short. They matter for you know sort of inhibiting uh, or blocking some parts of Russia's military modernization, and so they make sense in that context. But it's hard to be more ambitious than that when it comes to sanctions. So sanctions, I don't think are. are path out of this conflict. Uh, let me just say a few words about containment uh, historically, what it was and why I think it's relevant to the to the present moment. So containment comes up as an idea in 1946, 1947. It's associated with the figure of uh, of George Kennan, one of the great diplomats, certainly in uh, in American history. And this was a response to a novel set of problems for the United States after the Second World War. Uh, the Soviet Union didn't have nuclear weapons until 1949, 1950, so it wasn't really the worry about the Soviet Union as a nuclear power. But the Soviet Union, after 1945, you know, annexes, controls, 
uh, puts under its thumb a whole host of countries uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. And this was a very, very unpleasant outcome of the, uh, of the Second World War uh, for the United States. And Kennan kind of looks at this problem and asks what the U.S. Uh, can do. And what he feels is the U.S. cannot accept this. This is an unacceptable state of affairs. And so it's necessary to push against the Soviet Union. Uh, and that's part of what he meant by containment. But Kennan also acknowledged, uh, and of course, when the Soviet Union got nuclear weapons, this became even more, uh, you know, sort of more urgent. Kennan also acknowledged that the United States was not going to defeat the Soviet Union. The United States was not going to put 20 million young men into uniform and go to war against the Soviet Union in 1946 or 1947. So what Kennan warned against was the appetite for the unconditional surrender of the Soviet Union, but he also tr tried to find ways of, uh, of, of sort of holding the Soviet Union back uh, and preventing the spread of Soviet power. And the word he came up for that uh, was, was containment. And that remained the U.S. strategy for much of the Cold War. It's, you know, a digression when it comes to Kennan. He was very unhappy with the way that containment was actually applied by the U.S. government and felt it was too militaristic, but that's sort of another story. Uh, it does remain the U.S. strategy for the duration uh, of the Cold War. Why do I think that that's relevant now? I think it's relevant precisely because Russia is a nuclear power. Uh, and it's also relevant because Russia is a big country uh, and it has a big military and there's no appetite in the United States to go to war directly with Russia. Uh, and to defeat Russia. So this is not a Second World War type conflict, and it's not going to become one. I think the Biden administration has again and again said, this is not the war that we are going to uh, pursue with Russia. So unconditional surrender of Russia is off the table. We're not going to get that. Uh, Russia can sort of protect against that, uh, that development. At the same time, much as Kennan concluded about uh, the spread of Soviet power to Eastern Europe, this is not something that we can tolerate or accept. So we have to push against it. So you find a way of containing the spread of military power, political power, you know, sort of Russian influence at the present moment. You try to find a way of building a border wherever one can practically uh, between, you know, sort of Russia uh, and, and non-Russia. And then you manage the conflicts that exist around that border. That's a very tricky thing. And that might be more diplomacy uh, or other things. It might not necessarily be warfare. Uh, but you find ways to manage uh, that tension. So to sort of contain the problem and manage the tension, that's what I would put forward as the, as the U.S. approach. And it's, it's, it's time-tested in the sense that it's a Cold War approach, but what Kennan maybe didn't quite anticipate is that it's a very troubling approach for a country to do because you don't see a lot of positive, you know, sort of payoffs to it. Uh, it feels like you're not going the full distance. You don't have that moment when you kind of march through the foreign capital waving the flag and saying the war is over, we won. You're not going to get that. It's going to be much more indeterminate, sort of like how, how John F. Kennedy described the Cold War itself, a long twilight struggle. Uh, so, you know, as we try to encourage Ukraine to get as much victory as it can out of this, uh, I think we do have to remember that phrase, sort of long twilight struggle, and muster in the United States the patience that's going to be necessary to pursue those policies over the long term. And I think containment is a is a pretty good guide to how we could move forward. It's there have been many uh, excellent lessons, and this is another one, especially you as a historian, Michael, uh, giving us a good history lesson here. I mean, the it's it doesn't uh, um, it doesn't necessarily have the uh, the satisfaction of of winning that sort of thing necessarily or a clear cut uh, victory, but uh, containment as a strategy is especially given the real the the a more realistic outlook that this is a long-term uh, situation to be able to have that as a as, as a part of the framework. Um, it's not necessarily uh, always more largely discussed in our media and among the public necessarily, and it is something that we we probably need to think about more. That sort of um, that that sort of framework. So it's 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 really taken as a good as a good lesson there. Can I dovetail off of that question a little bit? Um, just what what should the U.S. be doing? uh going forward uh from now i mean um you know we've of course done many things so far we've given uh this is probably uh you can certainly correct me um perhaps one of the largest uh, uh donations or giving of military equipment to uh, and military provisions to another country perhaps that we have done in in recent if not modern history um you know we uh, we've we've been fairly consistent with that even though maybe we've been sometimes a little bit late uh when ukraine has needed it we've still done it we have done it uh, pretty consistently throughout the past year um you know on the negotiation front on the war provisions front um and maybe speaking to your containment strategy as well um you know what 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 
if, if you were advising the administration uh, going forward, what would be what, what should the US be doing uh, here? Um, you know, regarding these things, uh, same differently that we've been doing so far. So I can see three lines of uh, of effort, each of them quite uh, different, uh, sort of one from the other. I think that there's clearly the military line of effort that is in the foreground because this is a war after all, uh, and uh, you know wars are fought by by military means. I think the track record of the United States, although there are many you know sort of in Washington who are critical of the Biden administration for not moving fast enough. I think the track record of the United States is pretty impressive in this regard over the course of the last 14, 15 months. It's not just the hardware that the United States has given to Ukraine. It's the intelligence sharing. It's the targeting. It's, you know, the kind of assistance that a superpower like the United States can give to a country like Ukraine. Uh, and I'm not, you know, sort of uh, amazed by how slowly the Biden administration is, has gone. I'm amazed by how quickly uh, they've gone in this regard because it's not effortless or easy. There are logistical questions, there are domestic political questions, there are financial constraints. You know, what we've realized in the course of the war, it's a very simple point, but it's been driven home, is that munition is a finite thing. And if you use up a lot of your munition in one military theater, it means that you have less at your disposal in another theater. So that's, you know, been a constraint, but I, all things considered, I think that the Biden administration has done well there. And I think that the idea would just be to carry on. Uh, you know, we're going through a very, very difficult phase right now where Russia will be on the offensive for the next couple of weeks, maybe next couple of months. Uh, and then the offensive will turn uh, over to the side of the uh, of the Ukrainians. Uh, and it's going to be a, a, a tough phase to uh, to manage by no means uh, in, in, in every respect. But, um, you know, you can also say that Ukraine has kind of outperformed expectations more or less at every turn in the war. And so that may be uh, the story of the spring uh, and summer, sort of fingers crossed uh, in that regard. The second point, which doesn't get as much, uh, I think, media attention as it should, although we're all aware of it, is that Ukraine is a society at the moment under unbelievable duress. Uh, I mentioned the country losing a third of its GDP. That's in some ways the least of it, if, if you can say something like that. You have over 10 million internally displaced people uh, or refugees uh, in the country. You have uh, children, uh, it's in some ways, the hardest part of the war to, uh, to sort of reckon with uh, in an emotional sense. You have children who have been traumatized, whether or not they're near the battlefields or the front lines. You, know, you see these images, photographs of students in Kiev who are doing their studies uh, in subway stations and you know, students sort of doing their work uh, online as, as, as we remember our you know, sort of students doing during the pandemic, but it's with all of the trauma uh, of wartime. So the Russian goal has been since the start of the war, but even more intensively since then, is to sort of shred the underpinnings of Ukrainian society. Uh, and that's what war does anyway. Uh, and so there are huge responsibilities. I would say maybe Europe could go in the lead on this on this on this on this area because uh, Europe is is closer and European countries have so many resources, but certainly the US should uh, coordinate and uh, and assist with this. But there's just the task of keeping Ukrainian society afloat. Uh, and that's uh, as formidable uh, as the war effort. So that's, I think, the second point. The third point, and here I'd want to be a little bit, little bit critical of the Biden administration because I think that that's in order for these conversations. Uh, I think that the United States needs to listen more to countries that are on the fence when it comes to the war in Ukraine. So the framing of the Biden administration has been that this is a war of democracy against autocracy, uh, and you know this is a war of good against evil. Uh, and then there's this enormous bafflement and surprise that a lot of countries don't see the war in those terms. So who's right about the war in Ukraine? Is the United States right or is a country like India right about the war in Ukraine? I mean, obviously, from our vantage point, I think, you know, many Americans, not all, but many Americans would say that Biden has been, uh, you know, sort of effective uh, and has, you know, sort of his head screwed on straight when it comes to the war in Ukraine. But you also have to understand why a country like India would be on the fence. You know, they have a military relationship to Russia. Uh, they have economic concerns that, uh, you know, sort of are in favor of keeping the economic lines to Russia open. And India, when it looks at the United States, you know, doesn't see a flawless country. Uh, and especially, you know, sort of put the Anglo-American alliance uh, in this light, uh, it sees a lot of sins that were committed by the, uh, the United States that, you know, don't necessarily get Russia off the hook, but don't make this a struggle between good and evil. Obviously, China has its own take, uh, many different countries across the world. I think that the U.S. in this regard has to listen. It's fine, I think, to, you know, sort of put American leadership at the center of this story. It's, it's true. Uh, you know, the U.S. has played a unique role uh, 
uh, when it's come to the to the war. But let's not build the pedestal too high. Uh, let's remember that the Iraq War and the Afghanistan Wars were violations of country sovereignty. And I believe that this number is correct. Just put it out there. It may not be, but that the civilian deaths in the Iraq and Afghanistan Wars uh, tally to 250,000 people. These are not killed by American soldiers in most cases, but they're the sort of knock-on effects uh, of the wars in these two countries. And so the U.S. can do everything it can to support Ukraine, but some of the preaching and some of the self-celebration, I think, is off uh, and doesn't ring true in many parts of the world. And there, our diplomats would be much better served, I think, just by listening uh, and acquiring a little bit more nuance when it comes uh, to the war. And they may find that if they do that, that their arguments, you know, sort of go a little bit further with some of these societies that look at the war and say, well, not our struggle, something distant, or see a kind of equivalence between the United States and Russia, which if you look at the global data on this point, that's not uncommon that lots of countries see a kind of equivalence. So let's, let's you know, sort of uh, bring that to bear uh, as, as, as part of the story while acknowledging how much the U.S. has done for Ukraine. Believe me, you're speaking to my heart as a cultural anthropologist. Uh, you know, I look at look, you know understanding Eurasian cultures, other cultures that are quite far away from us and have much different history. You know, completely different histories than ours. And you know, it's it's a key point that we don't often think about. You know, we do have this history sometimes of uh, you know in uh, framing war as democracy versus autocracy, that sort of thing. Well, you know, we have sort of semi autocracies in part of Eurasia. We also have functional democracies that are, you know, have sometimes gone a little bit nationalist, like perhaps modern day India that, that you mentioned, that sort of thing. And so the I mean, these are, you know, if you look at the map of the world and you look at polling, like you mentioned, I mean, you know, I mean, goodness, you know, India and China alone, just, you know, you know, two and a half or more billion people. Uh, you don't necessarily have a lot of support necessarily for uh, the way we look at Russia, Ukraine, right? So this is this is very much a key area. When 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 we say and, we, and it's a good lesson for our students too, if I may elaborate a second. If if you if you hear media oftentimes say the world is is behind us or the world is you know uh, takes our position on this, well that that in some ways is wrong. I mean there is there is a large population of the world on the other side of the world that does not uh, see these things as we do. So it's it's an excellent point. Do you have time, Michael, maybe for one or two more questions? Yes, of course. Uh, well, thank you. Um, excuse me, let me bring up my my uh, notes here because I had a few. Um, so uh, so let's let's talk about maybe the uh, the effects on the Ukrainian and Russian populations perhaps or just the countries you know going forward um you know there's obviously been a large amount of disruption on both sides it's not just uh obviously what's been in ukraine has been horrific of course and the you know um, refugees uh even middle class and upper class refugees that are going to europe and other countries um you know we see the uh, obviously the effects on the economy there uh, as you mentioned in your previous answer and then on the Russian side, you know, we also have, uh, want to call them refugees in some ways, migrants out of the country there too, right? There's been a fair amount. And so you have a brain drain in some sense. I hope eventually, I don't know if we have any surveys right now, sort of good social science surveys about, you know, the, the populations that have left both countries, but I imagine we will at some point, uh, you know, if not now. Um, it's, it's pretty logical to see so far that it's, you know, a lot of IT workers, a lot of the uh, especially young and talented folks uh, moving out of these places. And so um, with, you know, with sanctions probably continuing in some form uh, on Russia and the uh, you know, partial, at least partial isolation, obviously on a whole, you talked about getting around sanctions. That's obviously a key point too. There are always ways to do that in most cases. Um, what can we talk about maybe just some initial understandings of what possible longer term effects on both countries, um, you know, just the populations and just how these societies function going forward. I'll start with Ukraine. I mean, I've mentioned, I think, what probably is the key point, uh, and that's the scale and brutality of the war itself and the way in which, um, all too reminiscent of 20th century wars, it's put, uh, it's put civilians in the forefront uh, of, uh, of the war. Uh, and so it's not um an accident in in terms of russian military planning that civilians are suffering in ukraine it's it's part of the war plan uh and you know we've discussed i think some of the aspects of that uh, already so i won't belabor uh the point that's not the only effect of the war on ukraine uh by any means uh you know it's not as if ukraine was uh, a basket case before 2022 it's not a rich country uh and it had its political flaws uh 
Uh, but you know the the description I would use for Ukraine before 2022 is of a you know fairly oligarchic system you know run by a handful of very wealthy people uh, and yes you know sort of corruption was an issue but you could almost point more to sort of cynicism uh, even after the Maidan revolution of 2014 there was a feeling that our government doesn't work for us and you know kind of alienation between the citizens of Ukraine. Uh, and their government, and that has changed with the war, as 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 wars will change that kind of uh, equation. Uh, so you know, I think that there has been uh, a, a, a new kind of uh, citizenship that has been born, been born in Ukraine as a result uh, of the war, uh, and that uh, is is an extremely significant uh, development. One of the things that's allowed the military to do as well as it has in Ukraine over the last twelve months is that you have a lot of civic voluntary activity behind it. You have people who provide clothes for the soldiers or provide food or, you know, sort of just contribute in one way or another uh, to the war effort. It's not all coming top down from Kiev. A lot of it is coming sort of bottom up from uh, Ukrainian society. And that, if one, you know, is up, is to be optimistic about Ukraine, that's the foundation in the post-war Ukraine for, you know, a, a different uh, and I would imagine better political uh, order, you know, did the war create Ukrainians, as people sometimes said, or sort of uh, did it create a Ukrainian nation? I think that that's uh, overdoing it. I think all of that was there before the before the war. But this sort of civic element uh, of the war, I think, it has been very significant, and that's where you can strike a note of optimism amid all of the the horrors and the evils of this particular war. The Russian story is really quite different. Uh, in in many ways, the war has not had that much of an effect on daily life. In Russia, if you don't have a family member who's uh, there uh, on the front, I mean, from what I've heard, Moscow and St. Petersburg remain kind of pleasure-loving, you know, sort of vibrant, um, you know, consumer metropolises, maybe with a few fewer goods. You can't get an Hermes scarf or tie, but you can still live lives of 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 of, of wealth and uh, of of enjoyment. Uh, and rural Russia was much poorer anyway, you know, sort of before the war, and just hasn't been that. Uh, deeply affected, I think, in sort of economic terms. But uh, there has been the outflow, exactly as you mentioned, the outflow of talent has been remarkable. And I think it can only be compared to the outflow of talent in 1917 after the Russian Revolution, when you had lots of middle class Russians who left or, you know, highly educated Russians who didn't agree with the Bolshevik Revolution and, you know, sort of spread uh, throughout the world. Uh, and it was a great loss for the Soviet Union in the same way that this outflow of talented young people is a great loss for uh, for Putin's Russia. So that's one uh, significant uh, transformation. I'll just mention two others uh, in the case of uh, in the case of Russia, but we could go, you know, sort of further down the list. But two other significant transformations are uh, the decoupling from Europe, uh, which is extraordinary, and that too is sort of like. The way it was in 1917, you know, Russia has turned its back on Europe with the war, and it's going to be very hard for Russia to return because the conditions of Russia, Russia's return to Europe, are reparations and war crimes. You know, that's that's it's going to be like Germany after 1945. If they want to come back into the club, that's what they'll have to do, and that's going to be uh, very very difficult for any future Russian government. So this decoupling from Europe is extraordinary. It was not there on the 23rd of February 2022. Russia was a highly networked and connected country to Europe before the war, that uh, has truly changed. And the other thing that I think has changed, although this is a slow trajectory that goes back into the early Putin years, is the militarization of society. That, uh, yes, there was always a cult of World War II and victory in the Second World War uh, and a strong sense of pride and patriotism about certain military accomplishments and achievements, that's been put into really high gear. And the education of young people now is being militarized. There's a permeation of society and culture uh, with military and martial values. Uh, I wouldn't use the fascism fra frame for this. I think it's, you know, that's 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 just not quite right. Uh, but it's a bit like that, the way in which, you know, the Nazis just tried to militarize society, make it militant, make it sort of uh, society in the model of an army. Uh, and I think that Putin has that in mind for Russia. And that's been one of the most terrifying changes to perceive uh, in Russia over the course of the last 12 months. Yes, the, the militarization has been a has been a key point. The out migration. Um, I, I think one of the fascinating, uh, not often brought up points you mentioned is the um, the younger generations here. Uh, you know, we um, NATO is possibly getting additions. You know, Sweden, Finland, and then of course I believe Ukraine. Uh, perhaps they did put in a formal application or are intending to. Um, you know, 
um, we're, we're going to see perhaps NATO change a little bit. And, you know, how much uh, of this sort of younger generation, we have some younger leaders, I believe, in Finland and otherwise, you know, that are, may, they, you know, maybe not, um, uh, maybe there's more pro uh, sort of uh, Europe and Western alliance than perhaps uh, we necessarily uh, thought, you know, some years ago. So who knows? There are obviously other examples in Eastern Europe that don't follow that right now always. But uh, but it, it, looking at the future generations is always, in generational terms, is always a fascinating thing because you almost never know what you're going to get in some cases. So, uh, so, so that'll certainly be interesting. Maybe we could end here in the last few minutes, uh, Michael. Um, you know, uh, talking to our undergraduates here and, and talking to the broader public, uh, why should we care about the Russia-Ukraine conflict? Um, and, and especially saying that now, again, almost a year in, um, and again, the possibility of this going on for some time, um, to sustain that caring about it, right? Which is obviously in some ways can be a little, get, a little bit against human nature. We do talk about human nature for my students, you know, in our anthropology and sociology classes. Um, you know, how to sustain a level of caring. Why should, what are some of the fundamental reasons? why we should care about this and pay attention to it as an important world event, maybe the most important world event uh, going forward. Yes, a uh, you know, question very close to my heart and one that we should be having, I would, I would say as U.S. citizens, I think we don't always realize how important the role of the U.S. plays in, in the world uh, is. As U.S. citizens, this is a conversation, of course, for all the people who are in the U.S., whether citizens or not, but uh, uh, as 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 a question for U.S. citizens, I think this is a very uh, urgent uh, and uh, and crucial one, and it should really be debated. As much as it's discussed, it should be debated because it, it you know you deserve to have the back and forth on, on questions of this um, size, scope, uh, and and scale. So um, three points in terms of why uh, the United States uh, should care, uh, and they're all I would say. Uh, equally important. Uh, the first uh, is about Ukraine itself. Uh, you know, it's it's an event of global consequence and significance, but you don't want to forget the people of Ukraine. Uh, in this story, they deserve to have, uh, I would say, the people of Ukraine deserve to have a starring role because this is first and foremost uh, their tragedy. And, and you know, I think a lot of the points here have already come up in our conversation. The number of internally displaced people, the number of refugees, the uh, the scale of destruction of, of civilian infrastructure, uh, you know, sort of all of that is, um, you know, sort of enormously important. In a different sense, Ukraine matters for what it is, for where it is, and for its position. I myself, I've been a student of Ukrainian history for sort of a while, and I worked on these themes and uh, these questions in government. I have been surprised by the number of ripple effects that have come from this war in Ukraine. So I wouldn't necessarily have thought of global food supply as being that much affected. I think everybody knows that Ukraine is the breadbasket of Europe and a kind of agricultural uh, powerhouse, but I didn't realize that global food supply would be as affected by the war uh, as it has been. And I think we know that from the Syrian civil war that began in 2011, that was partially about drought and food supply. Uh, and so we don't know yet, this is only the first year of the war, but the destabilizing effects of this war could be felt in the Middle East, they could be felt in Africa, they could be felt in Asia because of this question uh, of uh, of food supply and sort of Ukraine's place uh, in the larger I don't know, international system or, or global economy, however you choose uh, to put it. So Ukraine is just one of these places, and I think it's been this way for hundreds of years, that uh, is one of these global pivot points. There are other countries that are, uh, that are like this. A country like Canada <laughs> is not a global pivot point. It's a wonderful country and it's important in a thousand ways, but it sort of doesn't hinge, a lot doesn't hinge necessarily uh, on, on, on what's happening in Canada. Ukraine is, is different and a lot does hinge on that and that makes the war, uh, you know, sort of important in its own right. Second point is Europe. Uh, I wouldn't want to overly dramatize the point. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, not that the future of the world hangs on this war, but Europe will be determined by the outcome of the war in, in, in truly important ways. Uh, and if Russia is successful, what it will do is bring the Russian army very close to a number of NATO members. Uh, and the tensions that would ensue from that uh, would put the Cold War to shame. Uh, so it would be a new world uh, of very acute tensions and American citizens should care about that because the US plays a leading role in NATO. Uh, and they would be, uh, the United States would be uh, at the, the center of that. If Ukraine wins, holds its own, you know, sort of carries the day, uh, you know, that also will have deep implications uh, 
uh, for Europe. It won't rid Europe of all its problems, and it won't rid Europe of the Russia problem, which is going to be there you know, sort of one way or another, whether Russia wins or loses, uh, but it will be much easier to deal with uh, and to manage, and there will be the kind of boost of self-confidence that comes from having successfully carried out you know, whatever exactly the mission is. So I'll put it this way, it's maybe a little bit too stark, but as goes Ukraine at this point, so goes Europe. Third and final point, uh, this uh, conflict is new terrain. Uh, it's much more fluid and chaotic than the Cold War was, at least the Cold War in Europe. And that means that we have for the first time two nuclear powers that are very close to something that could be described as a shooting war, uh, an actual war. Uh, that's how it has to be for the U.S. I think they've made the correct choices in terms of the support that's been given uh, to Ukraine. Uh, but the stakes are unbelievably high uh, in terms of the future of warfare and the future of nuclear war in ways that I think none of us understand. Not President Biden, not President Putin, uh, not all of the <laughs> put all the world's experts together and they just still don't really have a, uh, a grasp of this. And so this matters to all of us in the sense that I'll put it this way, sort of my concluding words. We have no margin of error. On this on this point there's no margin of error when it comes to nuclear conflict and to avoiding it or or or, or preventing it we have to get that right uh, and there's no way getting it right at this point can be done without successfully managing whatever is happening uh, in ukraine so it matters as much as any cold war conflict did in that regard as well so for ukraine for europe uh, and for american citizens especially this nuclear element is 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 uh, of the essence there are, there are large scope effects here, and when you have the two largest nuclear powers uh, in some sort of uh, you know, conflict in some way in the world, there's obviously going to be large scope effects, as, as you said. Uh, uh, Michael, this has been a wonderful, uh, wide-ranging uh, conversation uh, from the reasons up leading up to the war, uh, to the current conditions of it, uh, the management of it, our response to it, uh, the world's response, and how we should think about it generally going into the future. Um, we've hopefully covered a lot of ground and it's been a pleasure having you. Um, I know our audience has enjoyed it too. Uh, and uh, you've given us a lot of key and not always uh, as much talked about as they should be lessons uh, from both history and the current situation for us to chew on and think about. So, uh, so we thank you uh, for being here on the RCBC Global Studies Lecture Series. It was wonderful having you. Brandon, thank you so much once again for the invitation and thanks to all of you for the terrific questions and uh, wishing your program all success, uh, and when it comes to these themes, you know, can conclude, can conclude with three words: to be continued. There you go. That's the, that's that's the right perspective. That is right. All right, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us on the Global Studies Lecture Series, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, folks.